Hello. Right, if you're watching this, you've probably already seen part one where we made a load of beer. Now we're going to try it. Uh, this is the first time, genuine first time, I've cracked open a bottle of vine from Pareil. Mark's obviously here. <laughs> and then we're going to open it up and test it. You know, glass. Smells like beer. Cheers. Cheers. Well, that's not offensive, is it? No, it's not terrible at all. Go to on, say, describe the taste. Um, I would say it tastes almost like a kind of quintessential English ale with the um, uh, kind of slight aftertone of the village blacksmith. Most like an old speckled hen, I'd say, but it's got a slightly different, a slightly darker taste. Yeah, not quite the hobgoblin darkness, but yeah, good stuff actually. Mm. Yeah, I was half expecting to have to go to our backup plan, which um, we have a backup plan because Mark was very dubious about the quality of my water here. When he went away, he made his own batch of iron thumper ale which is what the glass bottles here are. Um, we'll get into these then. That's a bit more lively, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> How come that's so much more violent than mine, wouldn't it? So I stuck a fair bit of priming sugar in it. It's got a bit of head going on, hasn't it? Yeah, but this is exactly the same recipe. Exactly the same recipe. Um, yeah, uh, just tap water instead of, yeah, same hops, chill. I'm quite happy drinking either one. Mm. It doesn't taste like home brew either. No, what I find with brewing with all grain recipes is, is you generally don't get it with that kind of home brew flavour mm. that you get with um, with the kits. I've never had, I've never really had a particularly bad result from an all grain brew, but the um, yeah, it, it, if you got served this in a pub, you wouldn't think, you know, well, that's weird, um, which is always my test. Really. So I'd call that a success, yeah. <laughs> I think so. Yeah. yeah. Bang in. Right, we're going to crack on with a few more beers, and um, we're going to. I'm going to go and find the questions and um, print them out, and then we'll get stuck in the answering those. Q and A session. Right, we're back. Um, I don't know. If it's a bad omen or what, but Mark's decided to poo-poo my beer and just drink his own. It was the first one that came to hand. I got four of yours left there. So we've had a few Iron Fun Parales now, and we're ready to tackle the questions. Um, <clears throat> Mark James, A up Max and Mark. I believe that as well as nature, engineering has provided some of the world's most beautiful things, either in aesthetics or simplicity. Some of my most admired are the Barrow Pen, the Land Rover series, and the Leyland Mini, but my favourite has to be Concorde. What would you consider to be the world's most beautiful man-made creations, and why? It's often been said that sometimes um, things uh, evolve to their point of perfection. And one example I can think of of that is the Fender Stratocaster guitar, which kind of reached the pinnacle of its production many, many years ago. It hasn't significantly early changed on. since, very early on. Yeah. And it's become very... So if you're looking at a, a basic bit of kit that you can have, but I think... You did say man-made creations. Well, I'd say that, yeah, the Stratocaster counts as that, doesn't it? Well, yeah, but I always I think, think the, bigger the scale best man-made creations are things that have become archetypal. So a Stratocaster would be like that. If you mm. drew a silhouette of a Stratocaster, everyone knows that's an electric guitar. So yeah, I mean, yeah, that's yeah. an archetypal electric guitar, so that's a, a really successful design, isn't it? I think another, an archetype I think that's, that's a very beautiful thing aesthetically is an anvil. Mm. Mm. An anvil is something that's evolved over, I'd say, millennia to be the shape it is. It's an utterly, it's purely function. No one's designed an anvil to be that way specifically from scratch. Mm. It's evolved that, that shape, that particular shape. I'm talking about the London pattern anvil, like mm. the one that I've got. Yeah. That's, a, that's just a, it's a really lovely design, but it's also an utter archetype. Everyone knows that that's an anvil, even if people don't know, even... People don't know what blacksmiths do anymore. You know, like the f first question I get is either can you can you make me a sword or do you shoe horses? 
and it's no, if, if you're wondering, <laughs> on both counts. Um, but ever, but still, everybody knows what an anvil shape is. You mm. know, maybe just from seeing Roadrunner cartoons or something. But you know, I'd say, yeah, definitely an anvil is one of mine. I, I think the the implication in the question, though, I know I know he gives an example of um, of sort of various bits of kit, the Land Rover and everything, but <clears throat> man-made things. Maybe we go into big scale stuff, but I would say, of everything that I've ever seen in my life. I've, Created by man, my favourite thing must be um, the Sagrada Familia in uh, in Barcelona. Um, if you're going to do stupid projects and have silly ideas on a massive scale, I think it's one of the places that uh, if you haven't visited, you should. I um, to decide to build a cathedral in modern times is pretty mad anyway. But to decide to build it with no right angles and with these ridiculously tall towers. This is the that, unfinished one. The, the unfinished, the, the um, Gaudi's yeah, yeah. designed for the cathedral. It's, it's a lot more finished now than it was the last time I went. I, I was last there about 10 years ago. Um, I saw some photos from a friend of ours who's been there within the last couple of weeks. And it's an epic structure. And it's taken so many people so long. It's been, the you know, a lot of people's lifetimes work. So from the sublime electric guitar to the ridiculous... Um, we can create some pretty epic stuff. Mm. So I'd say as well, you know, if we're going on the big scale, Sagrada Familia. Tell you what, on a much smaller scale, I think the Zill 131 is a lovely bit of design. We've come to know it quite well recently. Yeah, but <laughs> what I always always think when I look at the Zill is, is I always compare it in my mind to the British version, which I also own way back, um, the Bedford MK. Mm. The Bedford MK is just... Um, slightly more rugged and four-wheel drive version of the Bedford TK which was just a really common commercial vehicle back in the 60s mm. and all they did was jack it up put four-wheel drive on it and that was the military vehicle whereas the Zill the Zill is just made for an, it's on an absolutely different level you know it's made without compromise and it's and it's done like that because it was made in a state factory, hmm. you know, to a state specification. There was no tendering for it. So, I mean, it wasn't built down to a price. It was built up to a spec. Hmm. And it's a, it's a lovely thing. And I think lots of Soviet stuff was like that. Lots of Soviet engineering was in conception amazing. Hmm. Often in actual production, just a bit shit. You know, I'm thinking of like the, the space stuff, you know. I mean, famously, the quality control... So the design wise yeah, some yeah, of yeah. it was brilliant <clears throat> but you know the quality control just wasn't there and hence you know people burning up and re-entering things like that but, but that's still in the early days i <clears throat> hadn't even considered now you've said about the space stuff i mean the soyuz capsule um the, the the soyuz launch platform is still the most reliable the safest way of getting people and kit into orbit it's brilliant it's stood the test of time it's barely been um uh, changed since I think it was the early 60s, probably late 1950s. Mm -hmm. As soon as they got a design that worked, they just kept with it and didn't significantly change it. There's been some modernisations to the electronics, the computers, all this kind of thing. But the thing that put Tim Peake into space just a couple of years ago um, is not that different. It's from, Apollo era technology. Yeah, yeah, Apollo era technology, but you don't see the Apollo era kit sort of being used in quite that way. So we've gone through the space shuttle. Okay, the Russians had a go at the space shuttle. But, but that's the same that's the same ethos as with the Zill. Mm. You know, the Zill was something you had the Zill um what is it called? The one five seven mm. and it was the predecessor of the one three one. Then you had the one three one come out. It was such a successful design, they just carried on making it. Mm. You know, it wasn't improved, it didn't need to be. There was no there was no commercial impetus to try and make a different model each year, you know, to sell it anymore. They didn't make because it. Because there was only one better. customer, you know. Yeah, yeah. yeah they, you know, that was the state. So yeah, they just kept on pumping them out once it had been the design had been perfected, and the same with the Sawyers as well, I suppose. Mm. Seeing as it looks like you'll be making something wood fired to cook beer mash, can we see your take on a rocket stove? Also asked by Roger Rabbit. Ah uh, yes, two, that means two people asked that question. Oh okay, well, what about rocket stoves? Dean from Wales and someone called okay, cool. Roger Rabbit. Yeah. Um, Have I got any cause to build a rocket stove? Not in the near future. I don't think I have in the near future. Um, they seem quite simple to build. I'm sure they're lovely. Mm. Um, 
Maybe I'll build on one day. I don't really feel the need for one. Have you not built one? No. Oh, well, maybe I can. Oh, crack on. I, I built a rocket stove. <laughs> um, of course you did. I did a... Um, I had a load of leftover bits of um, steel. Did you build it for a reason? Um, yeah, um, I were, we were doing a bit of uh, random summer camping where weight wasn't an issue. Normally, I was used to doing lots of camping where you have to carry everything. And, um, but we were going on a few extended camping trips and um, using the usual epigas kind of um, camping gas uh, stuff. It's all very well, but um, I'd seen rocket stove designs online. It all seemed to make sense. So I made one out of, um, I, I welded together an L-shaped bit of um, uh, uh, steel pipe. I just cut a 45 degree um, uh, You mean you welded together. two bits of pipe in an L? Welded two pipes of, bits of pipe in an L-shape, put it inside uh, an old uh, expansion tank. Um, I, uh, I made the flue pipe slightly bigger than the, the feed pipe, so I think it was about probably maybe six inch diameter um, pipe coming up is the, the, the flue with slightly smaller, I think it's just like five inches. There's a so. reason for that, I, mean, I was just saying um, they're supposed to be the same, aren't they? No, I, I read on, uh, there was a lot of stuff online about rocket stoves, as anyone who's mm. it, but there was there was definitely something about um, them needing to be different, and it was what I had lying around, it was just scrap. So I welded them together, I put them inside a, 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 a old steel expansion tank from our old oil boiler, and I filled the gap around the outside of the tank with um, vermiculite which uh, I had lying around but again it was for insulation um, uh, I put I welded a bit of steel at yeah, a 45 degree angle inside the flue apparently to give the flue gases a bit of a swirl again something I read what in a, in a square tube uh, no no it's all round tubes oh, right. oh, really? it's a, you know, and um, uh, I welded a plate in the middle of the, the feed tube going horizontally so that you'd put your sort of wood in on top and the air would blow in underneath, have a bit of a swirl and uh, anyway I fired it up and it's brilliant, it really works. The only problem is it does need, a, a small rocket stove like that needs a lot of tending. Mm. Um, the first thing we did, I had um, sort of, uh, you know, little Sally was there, she was quite small then and we got a massive frying pan, put it on the top and we cooked a huge fry up. There's, I put some photos on Facebook. And See stuff. this is the things that people have said to me you should get a rocket stove and put in here in the in the limb room. It would be a different thing. Now I've seen rocket stoves done with um, old forty gallon oil drums, where you've got that as the and uh, you've, you've got as in part there, of a mass heater, isn't as it? As part of a mass yeah. heater, you've got an awful lot of mass in the form of concrete blocks, clay, all this kind of stuff, gravel chucked in but there. So you're restricted on this, the size of what you can stick in there to burn, aren't you? Uh, a little, yeah. I mean, definitely with the little, the little version. I very efficient way of cooking breakfast, but you have to, you know, you're having to put very small sticks in, and you don't need a lot. If I was put, if, if I was making a fire to cook that breakfast on, I need a fair yeah, amount of timber. Yeah. I needed much less in the rocket stove. The people I've seen using rocket mass heaters, I've only seen one in real life, and it was one that uh, uh, another off-grid friend of mine made um, next to his caravan, and it, it had the tendency to just get really hot and fill the caravan with um, paint, paint fumes. But um, <laughs> I'm sure it could be made to work well. Um, up, upside down oil barrel, a big pipe coming in, heating the mass there. What was great about it, you'd light it for two or three hours on an evening with a fairly small amount of fuel but because it had a, uh, it had a 45 degree angled uh, feed tube going into it you could you fed it kindling it was just long bits of kindling that yeah, you just kept but putting that's, in. That's the thing is I've got other uses for that sort of stuff to me it's, it's a lot of work. It's more useful to have that kind of that small material if I had it I'd be using on the kitchen range to cook with. Well or making charcoal presumably. Well yeah I'm, well kind of kindling type stuff is really handy for cooking on the wood burning range with, mm. you know. What I like about the giant stove I've got here is I can put giant lumps of wood on the giant stove, yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. and they burn really slowly. But also it means when I'm processing wood, wood that's easy to process, I can do so. I can process it. Wood that's difficult to process, like it's gnarly or, you know, just a huge lump of knotty nonsense, instead of having to dissect it with a chainsaw, which is what I was having to do before, I can just keep that bit now, and that's sort of like a late night log that goes on the giant burner. Mm. So it's really handy like that. What I'd be inclined to do, if I if I rebuilt the barn, or you know, built another barn or whatever, or, you know, built another home, I'm trying to say, I'd probably go for something like the Finnish or Russian mass heaters, mm. which incorporates a lot of that idea of the rocket stove mass heater. 
but you have a big firebox you can put something on. And what they tend to do, from my understanding, is they light you know, a big fire and then it stays warm for 24 hours or so. But they have a whole, what I do is have one end of the building as a huge mass, you know, I'd have it's one end of the building stone. as stone. Yeah, yeah that's yeah, what I'm trying sure, to say. Yeah, yeah. But with, um, with the flue going all the way through it to mm. extract all the heat from it, something like that. Yeah, my, I noticed that a lot of... Uh, a but lot it's the processing, you know? It's the, yeah. If you, say if you had a willow plantation, a, a, a rocket stove might make more sense because you can harvest your willow and that kind of material, you've only you cut it to length and it's done there and it's ready to roll in there. Mm. You can feed it through. If you harvest it in the winter, it's got no leaves on it. You know, that's the sort of thing. I think if you harvested willow, dried it out, you could then burn that in a rocket stove quite effectively. But for me, if I'm splitting wood and trying to split it down to you know feed it into a rocket stove, it's just a. It's more faff than I want to go to on a daily basis. You know, that's. What I like about both of my stoves, in their different ways, they're very easy to keep up with. They burn bigger wood, less processing. Well, they have, and and the, the nice, they're different as well. They burn different sizes of wood. So that means when I'm processing it, you naturally end up with different types of wood, don't mm. you? And the skinny wood can go on that one. The fat wood can go on there, you know. And that one does work well with big wood I can kind of yeah, testify to that sometimes even in the winter too hot to sleep too hot in. yeah <laughs> yeah this as well I've, when will we see the promised charcoal making <laughs> um, I think when the retort kilns built again then it's going to be fired up again isn't it and yes well you haven't done a video on that and that's what the when I first knew you that was one of the big things you were into then because it all still worked um, and I've still got some of your charcoal, and it does work very nicely. Yeah, almost pure. You know power. what happened? We started Project Awesome. No, no, no. <laughs> no. Was, no. Um, I got into. I was chatting to somebody on a dating site, right? And they wanted. That was it. They wanted me to forge them some fire fingers. Have you heard of those? You know, like you get fire staffs. Yeah, okay. Yeah, this was some kind of performing woman. Fire fingers are things that you put on your fingers, and you and the, so it's a, like a socket that goes on your finger, a steel rod, and then a, a wick. Okay. Which you dip in paraffin and yeah. you light, so you can. I don't know what, what the fuck you do. Anyway, I was, I was like, yeah, <laughs> I'll forge that, you know, it'll be a date. And so I enthusiastically made the last batch of charcoal just for this purpose yeah I made up like I know were like two barrel loads of charcoal just so that this lady would come and let me make her some fire fingers <laughs> <laughs> she never turned up <laughs> we'll just draw a discreet veil over that one. I've I not think. made charcoal since. <laughs> <laughs> we'll get him back into it. Um, yeah, 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 Dean, we haven't. really will. I honestly haven't. Well, I'm going to be running out soon as well. So we no, need so, to. So how many years ago was it that I last made charcoal? Um, you no, you did fire up the kiln. You posted a video. Um, mm, that was the last one. That was only a couple of years ago, I think, yeah. wasn't it? But but then we we part the daff where the um. Uh, retort kiln is and then moved it down the bottom to where the old zill was. It's all very cool. Yeah, it's like musical it. projects. They get moved around. I what I intend to do is to make a video on how to make charcoal without having to make a retort kiln. So I'm going to do the first way I made charcoal was with an oil drum. Mm. And that's a lossy way of making charcoal, by which I mean you lose some of the yield yeah. by setting fire to it in the first place. But it can be made with just an oil drum and some mud. That's all you need. Yeah. So I'm going to do a video on that using one of the oil drums, and that'll also make some charcoal and um, save me having to buy more coal. I've only ever made charcoal on a small scale, and it was back in my stage pyrotechnic days um, for uh, making air float charcoal for black powder. And uh, what I used to do was use um, the best thing for that that kind of air float was just random bits of pine batten that you you know from B and Q or whatever. Cut it into lengths. Really I just soft with charcoal. Yeah, um, for I, I found it crushed down and made in uh, uh, process in a ball mill, made into really fine, you know, what they call air flake, where it's um, uh, you know like, almost like dust. 
Um, the most effective I found was just cutting bits of um, batten to that kind of length. I put it in one of those kind of, you know, the coffee tin things you get from yeah, yeah. Ikea or whatever. Um, uh, when I had the, the wood burner lit on a night, I just, I'd had a, a little hole pierced in the top of the, uh, the, the tin. I'd pack it up with this, um, this batten, put the lid on, stick it in there just before bed, and um, if you stayed up long enough, you'd get a um, gas flame coming out of the. So that is a retort uh, Just a tiny version. Yeah, yeah. But in the morning, it all cooled down. You bring it out, you'd stick it in the ball mill, grind it all up, sieve it, and um, that was really good. Small amounts of charcoal for doing tiny amounts of black powder with, but well, I think different uses. I making think. a video of, of making charcoal in an, in an old drum mm. is quite a good idea because it's, they're easily available. You know, even if you don't end up with surplus old drums like I do. Mm. You can buy them on eBay for like a fiver. Yeah, they're not. Um, so it's uh, it, it's more viable for people to make at home than the giant retort kiln. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the the thing with the retort kiln though is when you consider the other options, which is, you know, where I kind of hang out in the Forest of Dean. There's a big thing there because the locals are allowed to burn charcoal in the forest, and they make a big thing of it. And you see these guys who spend days out in the woods with these massive piles of um, timber they piled up and they put turf over the top they spend I think 72 hours it takes or something just patching mm. up holes in this and you know to, to get their charcoal when really if you've got a retort kill and you can just be producing it quite efficiently yeah on a very on small the other hand, there's no need to live in there's no functional need to live on your land then is there if, ah. if you're making charcoal <laughs> yeah Shh. <laughs> exactly. I see. I always thought the hippie, yeah, 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 okay. hippie mafia are about to get me if I ever publicise them at all. Kill. Yeah. Okay. Okay. We'll, 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 again, sweet bells to be drawn. Well, that's how um, Ben Law got to live on his land. That's that was his justification for it because he was a woodsman. Yeah. And he said because he had to be there to tend the kiln, therefore he must live on the land. But yeah, the retort kiln it's all over in four hours. Yeah. Like so many other things in life. Right, here's one from Neil Clements. Um, <laughs> love the channel and all the twiddling around you guys do. I have a question for you. Uh, with all the firewood and charcoal that you can produce and given that you run engines for power a lot and are an accomplished metal worker, have you ever considered making a gasifier, wood or charcoal, to run the old homestead on? So have you considered gasifying things? Yes, I have. Really? Yes, I've made one. Then tell us about this. Okay. I made a charcoal gasifier and it worked and it worked well. I've seen it. Yeah. Now the issue with gasifiers, at least in my experience, is that they need tending. The gasifier is a lot like running a steam engine. It needs a lot of attention all the time in order to make it work. So you can sit there. I had a charcoal gasifier which I made from a um, basically an upside down um, butane cylinder. That was smouldering charcoal, which was then being fed through a Land Rover radiator sat in a big vat of water, which, what am I doing here? Condenses, is that the word? It looks like you're raving. From no, that. they're shrinking the gas down smaller. Okay, condenses. That would be condensing, wouldn't yeah, it? Probably. Yeah, probably. Making the gas more dense. Condensing. Yeah, condensing the gas down to yeah and then cleaning it for a filter which again a Land Rover filter and then it goes into an engine um, so I was using an old military generator which I'd converted to propane and then once you convert something to propane it's a it's a trivial step to convert it to wood gas I'd start up the generator on propane wait until the engine had warmed up and then use the running engine to pull f air through this gasifier system which would light the charcoal get the charcoal smoldering well when the charcoal is producing nicely you reduce the air intake and it's what you're aiming for is to smolder the charcoal rather than burn it smoldering charcoal produces carbon monoxide which is poisonous but also flammable when you can feed carbon monoxide into your system your engine will run on it um, but like I say, you do have to tend it then. You have to keep twiddling with the balance to keep it running smoothly. So you can sit there with your generator producing the electricity 
from Word and feeling smug about it. But the moment you turn your back on it, it'll all stop working. That's what I found. So yeah, I could like anything else. People say to me, "Can you do X, Y, Z?" Generally, the answer is yes. But is it worth it? And with gasifying, I found generally not. Um, I'll do it again, and I'll I'll try and make a more autonomous system with it. But it's it's not a priority. It's it's more of a um, for academic interest. Put it this way: during the war, during the Second World War, um, gasifiers were widespread. You know, there were there were a lot of them. They were generally running off coal gas. I remember once describing my system to an old man, and he said, "Yeah, I see one of those." I said, really? He said, yep. He said, in 1946, the London buses were running using gasifiers. They had a trailer on the back with a coal smouldering plant, and that produced gas, which was then piped all the way to the front and to the engine. But here's the thing. As soon as rationing was taken off of petrol and diesel, gasifiers vanished overnight. You know? <laughs> it turns out liquid fuel convenience wins out in the end you yeah. know? and that's that's the reality of it so yeah I'll go I uh, will try again with gasifiers but it's not a priority and it's not the it's not ever going to be the main way I make electricity the, the reason I use solar panels for instance is not because I'm a huge advocate of solar panels so much as they're incredibly reliable they require zero input the Sun comes out electricity is made that's you know <laughs> easy yeah, yeah easy yeah. easy peasy yeah. um Stuart Mackay says um please tell us a little about the circus era of your life <clears throat> for a while I lived as a nearest traveller with travellers uh when we arrived at a place um the locals tended to get very upset and called the police shortly afterwards um I was traveling with pretty much the same people but this time, all our trucks had circus written down the side. And when we turned up at village, everyone was like, yay! <laughs> 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 That's my experience of the circus. It was exactly the same as being a traveller, just more legitimate. And um, yeah, less uproar when you arrive somewhere. So, Tom Chase from Chepstow says, what camera setup do you use? That's a Panasonic H. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's really not. It's a, it's a H. H. Oh, let's get look. Okay, we we can we'll put it in the comments. Yeah, oh. we'll we'll put the camera in the comments. It, it's not a big deal. It's not about the camera. It's about the charisma. <laughs> okay, and um, the uh, shh, um. Okay. Yeah, also. Uh, where will you be taking Project Awesome when it's done? Where won't we? <laughs> Let's do that. <laughs> Let's really knew that your question and answer session would just fall flat on its ass because <laughs> who the fuck gives a toss anymore? <laughs> I'm just going to sit down. Um, <clears throat> it's nearly half past two in the morning, Mark. Really? Yeah. Right, now what? I'd just like to say thank you very much. Oh, for everyone who asks questions. No, you're not. I don't have a bollocks for them. Uh -huh. I say thank you very much for enlightening me and the making of the ale. Oh God, yeah, there's ale. It's the most agreeable ale. Yeah, the ale worked. To be fair. <laughs> oh, project awesome. Project, project awesome. awesome.